Hello. My name's Charlotte Allen and I'm the president of the Areas and Learning District Association. Welcome everybody to the third session of What's the Future of Living in Bushfire Prone Re Regions? And today's session is Planning for Unplanned Fires. I'd like to acknowledge the Wadarung and the Eastern Ma as the traditional custodians of the Otwe region and pay our respects to them and their ancestors and look forward to a shared future. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded and like the other sessions, um, it will be available on YouTube should you want to watch it again or if you've missed any of the previous sessions. Um, you'll be, we'll let you know when in fact it is going to be available on YouTube. You can ask questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and the questions will all be held over until after the second speaker is finished and then Birgitta Hutchins from DELP will take over as facilitator. In the last session, we heard from Janet Stanley, who spoke about the impacts of human behaviour as an ignition source, as well as of climate change leading to more and larger fires. Janet's insights into the complexity of arson and the motivating factors, the reasons behind it were particularly illuminating. Kevin Coulter's explained the history of fire in the Otways, fire energy inputs, and the need for the community to be involved in managing fire risks. His fire at stimulation videos were excellent. Janet and Kevin agreed that a change to empower and involve local communities more in the, in the fire risk management is needed, rather than a big government approach. Today's session, Planning for Unplanned Fires, will build on what we have learnt from the previous two very thought-provoking and interesting sessions. Our first speaker today is Barbara Norman, Chair and Professor of Urban Planning in the Faculty of Arts and Design in the University of Canberra. She's co-chair of the Global Planners Climate Action Network. And from 2011 until last year, she was chair of the ACT Climate Change Council and has advised the federal government on climate change and sustainability. Barbara has a personal experience with bushfires, losing her Malakuta home in the recent fires, although she was not there at the time. Janet, I mean, Barbara, over to you. Thank you. Uh, so um, thank you, Charlotte, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm a professor at uh, the University of Canberra, and my background's urban planning for many, many years, and coastal planning for quite a long time as well, and climate change adaptation. So um, sustainable communities, coastal planning, and climate change. And uh, clearly fire is part of that equation. So I'll just go now, given the time, um, to my presentation. I'll just share the screen here. And um, hopefully you can see that and I'll just start. All right, if someone could just say that, you, can you see that clearly? Yep, that's good, yep. thank you Barbara. Fantastic, okay. So um, although this is about fire, I guess the key message from this, my short presentation here as the first speaker is that um, uh, none of that can be considered in isolation. And clearly the context for you is the, coastal environment. So again, uh, considering um, I know you've had uh, some very good speakers to date around actual fire and uh, my, hopefully my contribution is bringing some of those threads together. And uh, if you've been participating in the earlier sessions, uh, there'd be no surprise to you that uh, this is the IPCC uh, uh, diagram that uh, we're experiencing a hotter and drier uh, future and uh, we need to be planning for that um, uh, now. Uh, again, uh, a risk management approach to these issues is very much uh, uh, considered a leading practice uh, in terms of, and I find this diagram still very useful. It is now a couple of years old, or probably four or five years old now with the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but it does, I think, very neatly bring a number of these issues together. So you'll see that if we're considering fire in the landscape and considering it in the coastal context, we need to be looking at uh, climate impacts clearly. We need to be looking at social issues as much as adaptation. Governance becomes important and uh, 
then in this circle here, vulnerability, exposure, hazard and risk. So I put that there as, at the beginning just to uh, provide a kind of conceptual framework, if you like, about uh, considering what is really quite a complex issue. And of course, um, the, the uh, impacts of climate change around the country uh, vary uh, depending to the country and up in the tropics, certain impacts and in the south. But very much in the south, uh, dealing with uh, a reduction in uh, rainfall and a hotter and drier environment. And of course, sea level rise has been rising, is rising and will continue to rise. So I know that's not to do with fire, but again, it's uh, providing a context. And just the last slide for that sort of broader context is uh, this comes from uh, the uh, National Oceans Office in the US and that, that has enormous resources if you want to look at that. And uh, again, picturing this uh, framework really saying that, you know, we, we need in a sense a healthy environment to support healthy communities to have a healthy coast. And so it's all very uh, interrelated and connected. Uh, coming back to the now, having the bigger picture, uh, yes, uh, it's actually our holiday house, um, Charlotte, uh, but then again, one of over four generations uh, built um, through uh, various members of the family over time, a house and a cottage, mud brick, and you could see from the intensity of the fire there that um, uh, not, much, not much was left even of the mud bricks. And so that was, uh, that was um, burnt, uh, it was a very hot fire that went through Malakuta. Although you can already see a very patchwork approach um, or impact, uh, and we found this the same with uh, Namaji National Park next to Canberra, um, uh, so near where I live, uh, where some areas have had this incredibly uh, intense impact and uh, burnt not everything, uh, not only everything above the ground, but also, um, really killed everything below. And so uh, uh, these areas um, that slide on the left, uh, there really isn't a blade of grass yet. And yet this one on the right where the house was destroyed, you can already see the greenery through here. So quite a patched work, um, in, patchwork of impact and uh, quite challenging in many ways to particularly how, how are we going to restore the, um, the areas that have been so intensely affected. Responding to climate change, um, this is obviously closer to where you are, uh, and I'm not sure if you, I'm just going to move that little thing across, um, accommodating many other pressures happening at the same time as dealing with fire on the coast. And I only put this up because uh, coastal communities are dealing with a great deal of issues, and fire is just one, and uh, there are only so many resources that local councils, com communities have, and uh, working out where, where priorities are and shared resources is, is obviously, as I said, governance can be really important to an effective strategy in the future. Just a couple of uh, recent research uh, projects. Uh, this one was uh, very much in the domain of today's discussion. Uh, it was a project I led for um, the uh, bushfire CRC and planning and bushfire risk in a changing climate. And uh, we looked at a number of uh, case studies around Australia. And uh, very much uh, as I've got there, the number of focus groups, um, planners and, and, and various people uh, trying to grapple with the responsibilities and also realising that you know, the, the whole impact, the cumulative impact, if you like, of fire and continuous fire is almost beyond the remit of any one, one group and well and truly uh, today. And so we have to work together is the key message there and one of collaboration. And uh, that, uh, that is, I'm sure, will come out of the Royal Commission nationally again. Uh, the second uh, study um, was in the southeast corner of Australia and really uh, involved the councils, local councils from Wollongong right through to uh, Lakes Entrance in East Gippsland, uh, uh, nine councils, I think, seven or nine. And um, uh, we came up, we, it was a study done over several months. Uh, it included all the risks that we'll be discussing today um, and fire was very much part of that. Unfortunately, the recommendations and our findings proved to be quite prescient and we saw it unfolding. So this study was done in 2013 with the local councils and the community. We came up with a number of principles and recommendations at the time. And then we saw the um, almost the inevitable unfolding over the summer. 
when I say the inevitable, it wasn't just about fire. It was drought, then it was fire, then it was flood, and now COVID. And so when I mentioned cumulative impact before, I, I was serious about that, that uh, coastal communities, certainly in the area in the southeast, and you can tell me more locally, um, are pretty exhausted at the moment uh, and finding it difficult to work out how to find the resources and the time and the energy to build back better after that fire. Um, an integrated approach you'll see there that, that, that we uh, be taking one of sustainability as a sort of foundation to anything we do in building back after fires um, or planning for uh, um, the inevitable fires that are coming. Precautionary principle of, uh, relating to development. Um, uh, so erring on the side of caution where there's risk, but we don't know, have to know 100% about it to be, be very careful in how we approach uh, development. And then forums like today uh, very much came through in the community consultation that we need more of those forums so you can share this sort of information. Process of ongoing community engagement and then skills. Uh, there's a, there is a, a, a capacity gap uh, both in the professions um, and in community groups around just the knowledge and the skills that we need to be able to deal with these issues. So uh, we need to be finding ways of um, uh, upskilling uh, uh, officers within local councils and with go in government on these issues, but also uh, providing support to groups to enable them to have exactly like today. And lastly, just a quickly, a process of continuous monitoring and evaluation as we do these, these kind of research projects. So as I mentioned, critically, just planning for cumulative impact, I won't go through all this, so better sharing of knowledge, collaboration, and scenario planning is really important when it comes to extreme events like um, fire, and I'm sure Justin might touch on that. Uh, so what if A, B, C, and D? And if you go through those, those different scenarios, then at least, uh, even if you think they're right off the wall, I mean, how many times do we have events today where uh, people come out the next day and say, well, we didn't think it would happen like that. And, um, and so plan for those things, take it out to the extremes, and there's nothing lost and possibly much to be gained by doing that. Uh, social equity considerations, adaptive capacity, there's my mother, she's now in her mid-90s, I think she was in her early, it was only about five years ago, and, and it was just, a, I just took that photo, um, she lives at Shoreham, Western Port Bay, and uh, the responsibility of caretaking all the nature strips and the bush around those uh, blocks uh, uh, is very much the uh, responsibility of the, uh, a landowner, and, and we have an ageing community, so I, just an issue that we have to think through carefully about how to work with an aging community. And then um, conscious of time, just the last few slides, I just put this up for a bit of humour, sort of the governance is important in these decision making processes and I'll just go back, it went a bit quickly, you'll see there. Planning committee, excellent, so that's all agreed then, all we need to do now is draft the consultation document. So I've been in planning a long time, so I have a sense, a sense of humour about those things, but um, sometimes it's not very funny. And um, so transparency and accountability is uh, critical. Uh, and then just lastly, um, some really interesting work is happening in integrating all these issues of fire and coastal management. On the right there, um, some of the Aboriginal land councils are doing terrific work, and that's an integrated land sea plan up in the north uh, northeast Arnhem Land. And on the left, nine councils working together southwest of WA from uh, Mandurah to the south, um, working together on issues of coast and climate change. I really recommend capacity building. I mentioned training. There's my coastal planning students um, at work, which is great fun, and enabling new there's a range of tools here, overlays, I've been asked to mention particularly, which is really just an area-based, a spatial approach to dealing with an issue. So um, you could have a heritage overlay, a bushfire overlay, all sorts of overlays. Um, may well see a climate overlay in the future. And it's really saying uh, within these areas, these particular rules apply. And um, it's not that complicated. I will just focus on integrated regional planning. Um, a lot of our approach tends to be, and I already see it in the interim report from the uh, Bushfire National, the Royal Commission, 
tends to be very focused on emergency services, more fire engines, more emergency services, but really we need to be uh, investing a lot more in strategic planning for the future. And I think my time's probably up, so I might just uh, finish here. So um, obviously we're working with climate change, but in doing that, let's, if we're building back better, we're planning for fire, let's uh, look at all these other things too, to make sure we're uh, doing it within a sustainability land. Because at the end of the day, um, we'd like to uh, have a, a more, more sustainable community, socially inclusive, uh, environmentally responsible, and out of that, a, uh, a, um, a green growth, a green economy. So thanks for listening and happy to answer questions later. And there's my contact details. I'll stop sharing. There we are. Thank you very much. Um, Barbara, our second speaker is Justin Leonard, um, who has spent 24 years researching how bushfire risk to life and infrastructure can be managed. He's a leader in bushfire urban design research in Australia, focusing on investigating the behaviour of buildings during unplanned bushfire events with a view to improving their prospects. His research combines learnings from bushfire exposure experiments with post-bushfire survey investigations and computer modelling of bushfire interactions with buildings. So welcome, Justin. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, share my... Yeah, so um, thank you all for a chance to, to have a chat with you. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, what it's like on the ground to sort of experience a bushfire and what bushfire risk at that individual house scale actually is. Um, one of my favourite pictures is actually the picture you've chosen as the, the, the lead in, in this forum and it's um, of Malcolm Gill's backyard in the middle of the uh, Canberra fire event when his back fence was actually being down. A very pertinent account from Malcolm about what it's like to actually go through one of these fire events. So just a bit of um, sort of paperwork related issues. The, um, the actual, uh, oh, next slide. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, I just wanted to quickly take you through um, some really useful intel about um, how things like the planning overlays can inform and um, be accessible by yourselves um, to start to contextualise where you are in the landscape and what um, controls both planning and building can play a role. Um, this is uh, a thing known as VicPlan. It's actually a public-facing website that, that shows us um, a whole lot of details. The website's at the top there, but it's probably easiest just to Google the word Vic Plan to bring up this uh, this mapping portal. And then um, once you spend a little bit of time getting used to these controls, uh, you can bring up layers and bring up bushfire layers. Um, and uh, I'll just take you through a few steps here. So here's a, here's a, an overview of a part of say Apollo Bay. So we can see quite a bit of um, vegetation to the top of the screen and then a bit more of a rural context down below with some included um, remnant vegetation and creek lines sort of abutting um, the urban area. If we um, click the BMO layer, this is called a bushfire management overlay, which is a planning overlay that brings in the certain planning controls if your house happens to be within that uh, creamy shaded um, overlay layer there, which um, which appear, uh, which stands out as, as not really impacting any houses here at the moment, except the ones that were up in the hills. Um, and, and that's sort of um, indicative of the risks that that treed, um, heavily treed area um, at the top of the map actually um, can present as a fire risk to um, adjacent structures. Um, if we click the next one down, which is called the bushfire prone area map, this is an area where bushfire is expected to reach. So it includes forested areas um, as well as heath areas and uh, some um, agricultural areas that can carry fire. So the fires might arrive more as a grass fire 
um, but it encompasses more and is sort of the next level down in, um, in the hazard potential that can be presented. And if we zoom in to much closer, it gives us a bit more of a, a sense. So we can see that treat area to the top left. Um, that's our bush fire management overlay. And it's actually starting to infer um, some areas of new development out the back of Apollo Bay might be subject to some planning controls. And if we bring in the bushfire prone area, the BPA, we can see that there's two parts to the BPA. One is the areas that are considered to be that to burn that can bring the hazard. But then this pinker buffer, which is the area that bushfires can reach out and extend beyond the vegetation and impact houses. So this could be described as the area where low level surface fire could come out of the bushland or embers can project some distance. And the, the depth of that buffer or the distance the fires can reach actually varies according to how serious a fire is considered to possibly occur in, in, the, um, in the, the vegetated regions. So I'd really encourage you to sort of explore this and use it as quite a, a useful context. And also, I guess, to understand whether you formally are or are not in a bushfire prone area and subject to planning and or building controls. So under some more sort of uh, uh, standard bushfire science, um, this is one of my favorite uh, contextual graphs, which actually gives us all of the loss that's occurred from across our fire history from zero to 100%. And our favorite categories that we see on our roadside signs from low through to extreme in code red. So as we move from left to right on this graph, we see these two lines building up to, uh, and the two lines are actually, the blue one is life loss, and the brown line is actually house loss. So by the time we get to the worst um, events that we've seen in history, we've included all of our life and house loss. What's really interesting is around the point where we get to extreme, between extreme and code red is this point around 100. And what's really interesting is about 60% of all of our life and house loss actually occurs on the few days that we've had major bushfire events that have reached code red. So really this is the contextual um, situation where we're most at risk. And you can see how the loss potential sort of drops away as we drop through those processes. So it's always really important to come back and think, really what is the fire weather context I'm trying to think and manage my risk under? And and the potential for code red fire where the days to occur along the coast is reasonably high. Um, it's, it's something like a, there's like a, a, something around a 5% chance of reaching that level in any given fire season. And unfortunately, climate change is going to actually um, increase the frequency of that. So we might move from five to 10 or even 15% likelihood in any given season. And in this urban interface context, we've got many aspects. Um, so we've got our house and its urban setting, and we've got the forest and, and what it can present to us. Um, so what we end up defining is the hazard, and more or less that's what the BMO or BPA is trying to acknowledge is here is an area that's hazard. And then that buffer area is the buffer that includes the urban region where embers, radiation and flame can reach. Um, and also what's really important is the environmental conditions. And what I mean by that is the weather. So what is the weather before, during and after this fire event? Um, and the weather can, obviously we're all aware that the weather can make the fire behave far more aggressively and it can project things much further. But at the same time, those environmental conditions could and, and do dry out our houses and the landscape immediately around them, making them more vulnerable 
to the embers and radiant heat and attack mechanisms that the fire brings. And unfortunately, they both peak at the same time to make both a high hazard and a high vulnerability. And we really need to be aware of that context. Um, this is actually um, Malcolm Gill's house in the Canberra fires. He's at the front of this picture here. And the picture was actually taken um, that we saw in, in the, my title slide in your forum thing from his back porch at the back of the house here, looking out towards his back fence. Um, Malcolm described uh, an amazing set of processes that occurred. One was a fire turned up through eaten out horse paddocks. Um, which you can see to the bottom of this photo, has a very low intensity fire spreading. Um, it arrived and quickly tracked through all the dry um, surface grassy fields in the urban landscape and moved very quickly and tracked right through the urban landscape. So low intensity surface fire. The second stage of the onslaught of fire on Malcolm's home was the stage two, which was more or less the stage where that photo was taken, where the vegetation and the fence lines and the heavy mulch ground surface fields burnt out over a much longer time frame compared to the fine grasses that burnt out. And Malcolm's recollection was that this was by far the most serious part of the um, attack on, on the home where the radiant heat and the, the smoke and embers were most intense. It was the burning out of the urban fuels that more or less belonged to and were immediately adjacent to Malcolm's house itself. Um, and, and I'd always um, emphasise the need to be quite focused on the most local fuels before thinking broader and broader in the landscape about the fuels that are relevant to you. Um, and of course, there was, there's always the context in a more uh, built up urban environment of structures burning down their neighbour's structures. So we shouldn't simply look at fences and vegetation as the fuel sources. We should look at neighbouring houses, particularly when they're only built metres away. So this question of trees um, and their role out in the bush and their role in this interface scene is, is a really interesting um, multifaceted question. There's, are they a friend or are they a foe in this process? Now, the, the pros of trees are that they provide shade and they help retain moisture in the landscape. So um, when, when the weather turns dry and we start reaching our summers, the trees and retain trees and shade actually allow certain areas to be the last areas in the landscape to dry out. And that moisture can actually reduce the vulnerability of your house or surrounding elements that are at risk of burning. Trees are also very good at attenuating wind. Um, they also can present as a radiation shield between you and the, and the fire front. And of course they have aesthetic qualities for most of us. Um, on, the, on the problem side, they um, can be an amber source, but only certain types of trees um, present um, uh, uh, as, a, as a nasty amber source and it relates to their bark type. So I'd, I'd encourage you to look at the various landscaping guides and uh, things like the CFA plant key that give you quite a good education in which types of trees and bark types in particular create um, a, a good ember sources and which ones are, are not an ember source at all. Um, they're, good, they're pretty good at dropping leaf debris and branches which can build up on houses and against houses and in all their nooks and crannies but also generally contribute to ground surface fuels um, in the landscape that we have to keep an eye on and constantly maintain. And they also present the, the risk of tree strike. So, so, so a big mix of pros and cons, obviously. Now, in terms of wind damage, um, it, it's quite evident in these fire events because some of the worst fire events um, inherently are high wind events. It's um, quite common to observe houses that have been directly 
weakened or damaged by wind prior to the fire turning up. So we're talking about dislodging roof tiles or um, peeling off roof sheets simply from the wind load. And of course, that's one of the last things you need when you have a fire potentially bearing down on a house, you don't want it weakened. So you need um, to consider that from the house's design perspective, but you can also consider it from not putting your house in an area where that has a high wind exposure or strategically retaining trees that help to attenuate that wind uh, action on your, on your house. Um, conversely, being so close to trees that the trees can fall onto your house, either when a branch drops or the, the wind blows a tree over or the fire actually weakens the tree and drops the tree um, on your house or on a, on a critical egress route is something we always have to keep a perspective on. It's, it's um, the amount of trees that fall during and immediately after a fire event is prolific and something we always have to um, be aware of in terms of trees condition and, and how that, that plays out. Um, on the flip side, um, here's a really interesting picture of a house in Y River, which has received quite a brutal radiant heat exposure from a neighboring house that was approximately 12 meters away. Um, what's really interesting about this picture is that half the house is relatively untouched, including the one pane of its window, which is not broken uh, in this wall. And the front part of the house um, section is quite heavily radiation scorched and the window glass is actually broken and the eave is heavily scorched. Now, the only difference between the front and the back of, um, section of this house is the presence of a tree that has acted as a radiation barrier between the neighboring property and this house. Now this tree um, has not burnt in the process, but it has appeared to have received quite a significant radiant heat load, which has caused it to desiccate. Um, but it, in, in that process, is it, it's acted like something like a 50% radiation screen. So I can roughly see 50% through that tree. Um, that's proportional to how much heat it has absorbed or blocked from reaching that house. So trees as a strategic radiant heat barrier can be very useful. And if you think of sort of trees in a really generic way, let's sort of look at, you know, here's a house and a neighbouring forest. Um, now, obviously, if the trees are too close, you're in tree strike distance, so that's a risk we don't want to deal with. So let's, um, but, but how far do we clear the trees back? Do we clear them back this far? Um, is that enough? Um, what if we didn't clear all the trees and the understory vegetation? We only cleared the understory vegetation and retained the actual canopy trees. This gives us a spot I'll call a staged buffer where um, the, the far left would burn quite severely, but it runs out of surface fuels and surface fuel support. Therefore, the remaining trees that um, have a grassy understory, um, therefore are there to block radiant heat um, and not necessarily contribute to an aggressive fire arriving immediately adjacent to the house. Um, and even in that context, the question is, if we retain enough trees between us and the unmanaged bush, maybe we don't have to actually clear the unmanaged bush as far. And so the, the open question is, which one of these two scenarios is actually less of a risk to the building? And I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so like I said, always really interesting to hear your really like evidence-based but very accessible way of, of helping us understand urban fuel loads. Um, there was particularly one comment that you said about looking at your local fuels initially, and I think that's a really good tip for all of us. Um, and particularly do it over the year. Don't leave it until the last minute. <laughs> I'd like to introduce us to, um, introduce you all to our panellists. I don't know if we've got everyone's up at the 
moment. And if they could turn their mics and cameras on. Our first panellist is Kylie Steele. Kylie is the Director and Principal Consultant of SCB Consult, which is based in the Otways. Kylie works in bushfire planning, design, emergency management and climate change. She supports and gives advice to communities and business owners in navigating the planning scheme process, which sounds huge. Uh, SCB consult Consults also works with business owners and particularly accommodation providers to develop bushfire emergency plans. Kylie is also the Deputy Chair of the Great Ocean Road Coastal Committee, Gork, and is a board member with Southern Rural Water. Hi, Kylie. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Uh, the next panellist is Pete Ashton, who was here last week as well with us. Pete works with Surf Coast Shire as Community Emergency Management Coordinator. He and his team work closely with Surf Coast communities to raise awareness in preparedness and response and relief delivery for bushfires. Pete also works on multiple projects, including fuel management, asset protection and local response planning. Hey, Pete. Hey. Our last panellist is Dave Roberts. Dave works with Forest, Ma Forest Fire Management Victoria and DELP, or part of DELP, it's very confusing, as District Manager for the Otways. Dave and his team cover a wide range of planning and operations in and around our public land throughout the Otways, and including cross-tenure fuel management, park infrastructure, planning, ops and protection, and also in community engagement. Hey, Dave. Hey, Begeda. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, so look, I am aware there's a few things. There's questions coming in and they do come in thick and fast at this point. So Mandy Baker from Colac Otway Shire and Surf Coast Shire is gonna help me facilitate. Uh, every time we do this, I feel like we never get to all the questions and I'm apologizing in advance because they do come thick and fast. They're quite hard to keep on top of. There is another, I am also aware of the difficulties that some people have with the audio in this. So just to let you know that we are looking to getting all the sessions transcribed in, you know, to increase access for people with hearing impairments. Um, yeah, so I apologise for that as well. So we do have a few initial questions. Um, one specifically for Barbara Norman around a question around, can you provide some more specific examples of building capacity, like skills and training in community in regards to bushfire planning or climate change? Sure. Referred to in your presentation. Yes, definitely. So I can certainly talk about my own profession. Um, so half my career is in practice, the other half in the academia. And when I was in practice, I was also national president of the Planning Institute of Australia. And in that role, I was extremely conscious, and I am now as a, as a, a teacher and an academic, of the lack of almost absence of any training of urban land use planners on uh, climate change, on zero on the science uh, risks. And so um, there's, there's one example. So uh, it's definitely uh, the professional bodies now um, the Planning Institute, whether it's in Engineers, Planning Institute, Architects are looking much more actively at upskilling professionals in the field, which are, who work through all the local councils, of course, um, uh, on the science and the uh, projected impacts for their particular region. So being much more skilled and prepared to do that. And of course, the same applies with the community. If, if in running those professional development courses in, in that context, you can see that concept being expanded uh, to have those uh, community forums. And today is exactly like that, but um, uh, more support for, for events like today to, to um, enable people to get those skills. Yeah. So. There's certainly been a great response to this series of webinars, so I agree with you on yeah. that, Barbara. I definitely yeah. could do this. COVID does have, give us these opportunities, obviously. It definitely does. And, and I co-chair this global network of planners for climate action. And, and we can see, so I talk to my colleagues around the world and we can see the same things happening, whether it's in yep. Europe, the States or in, uh, in Asia. Um, thank you for that. We do have a question for Justin. Can you please uh, go into a bit more depth of the hyper-localised fuels and in relation to house loss? 
Sure. So I, I think it's um, it, it's a good concept to keep in mind, like something like an onion ring approach, where the inner um, consideration of the vegetation immediately adjacent to or even under um, your house is the most critical vegetation that plays out in a bushfire. This, the, it, there's always a surface fire spread that comes through and ignites that really local vegetation and that burning up to and under and against your structure is, is the most relevant vegetation to address in the first instance. And then to think further and further out about the immediate landscaping and the uh, assembly of that vegetation and how that might burn in as, as an assembly and then further and further out is sort of the best hierarchy approach to consider vegetation. And it's also worth really trying to identify localized really bad misbehaving trees like think about a cypress pine tree or a, or a hedge of cypress that has a lot of really fine woody material that in a bushfire only needs a few embers to get into it to get burning and then it becomes a really prolific local isolated ember source um, right near a structure and and also to think about they're the fine fuel elements, but there's fine fuel and heavy fuel elements in there too. So you've got fences and stored materials that are, um, and vehicles, uh, retaining walls that all play out with that vegetation to create, bring these heat sources to, to your structures and to your potential to survive if your ha house actually starts to burn down and you have to move out through that immediate landscape to somewhere safe. Yeah, I think that onion ring approach or way of looking at it is just great. Really simple, straightforward. Um, I'm wondering if Mandy's got a question. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions here that I could probably just put together. Um, they're probably more for Pete, because they're about um, Shire. Uh, about um, what does, can the Shire do to pressure um, individual landholders to maybe clean up their properties, especially on that interface area where it could impact other um, other residents as well. And also a little bit about um, the fact that now we have the COVID lockdown and a lot of people can't get down from Melbourne to clean up their properties and what might be happening in that space. Yeah, so I'll, I'll touch on the way we look at it at the moment is we will assess everyone's house and if there are sort of clear breaches in, in the way the fuel is managed around their house, then we have a couple of legal avenues. We tend as a sort of a basic principle is to try and work with the community and to sort of build that knowledge. That's our sort of go-to position. So we do, we can and we do actually pressure people legally and just through conversations. Um, with, you know, and I, I think too, there's, just before I touch on the COVID part of that, um, I guess living in this landscape, we have sort of envisaged what it will be like. And, and I think to be truly resilient um, for in the house's perspective, there is a lot of work to do and to apply some of those sort of um, bits of information and science that people like Justin have developed over the years. And we do have a lot of publications around that. And I would encourage people to actually find those publications. We, we send out uh, a letter every year and we do put that on there. But it's really got to start with the community wanting to actually do this. We, we actually get a lot of pushback when we try and actually um, enforce some of this vegetation stuff as well. Um, so there does need to be a full sort of mindset change, I, I believe, for most people who have to understand the landscape we're living in. Uh, with the COVID stuff and people coming down from Melbourne, we have been pressuring the government to get a position on this and apparently uh, they're working on that now. So we're hoping that in the next week or two, there is some sort of position from the state and that people will have some access to come down to their places and clean up before the summer. We don't think we're in that critical part right now because the grass is still green, it's quite moist, but in the next sort of month or so, yeah, the pressure will be on. But um, yeah, keep an eye out, but there will be some sort of um, position shortly. Well, and I think we, <clears throat> excuse me, might put some of those links up in the follow-up email for this webinar. Um, I've got a question for Dave and then a question for Kyle.
Kylie and Dave, I'm, I'm, and this is probably for Pete too, but I'm pulling a few questions together. Um, so someone's actually asking from looking back at the 1940s where there was a network of designated fire breaks that were designed to protect forest ecosystems and I guess roadside bench, there's a reference to that there. Um, and now we've got these vegetation protection overlays on them. So why are DELT protecting uh, all of this vegetation on our roadsides and for those the old uh, strategic fuel breaks? And someone else is actually asking what are they, what are all these strategic fuel breaks about all over the surf, surf coast? And do they line up with what Justin was talking about? Dave. Well, oh, thanks, Begita. I, I think we've got another four or five hours to cover this topic, haven't we? <laughs> exactly. Like a start. Um, I'll, I'll start with, I guess, the broader concept of the strategic fuel breaks, because I think um, I think it's the information that's been provided today, I guess, is fantastic and starts to demystify a little bit about the type of science and thinking and strategy that us as fire and land managers have to apply in a, in a real sense. And so us, us in the, uh, I guess, the forest and fire management world, we actually need to convert this information into, into action. And that's the real challenge we have. And uh, we, we are at the moment going through a process of um, planning out and starting to implement strategic fuel breaks, um, ironically, within the Surf Coast Shire area, Surf Coast Shire footprint, so Anglesey areas inlet and lawn. And it's really, it's, it's really a way in which we can actually start to apply some of the principles and learnings of what I guess Justin described in his earlier presentation around starting to manage that interface fuel and starting to I guess trade off what we need to around protecting communities in uh, in these high fire risk areas but also by doing that work within that sort of uh, within that community interface we can also then um, we can also then do some of the harder stuff that we need to do. So plan burning right up against people's back fences. I'm not sure if anyone on the forum's ever been in control of a, a plan burn right up against multi-million dollar houses and communities. It's not a great thing to be involved in if you haven't got a level of certainty and confidence about how the fire is going to actually behave. So the strategic fuel breaks, which Justin sort of described in the graphic sense earlier, um, that's not only going to provide, I guess, that protection against radiant heat in a um, wildfire scenario, it's actually going to enable um, uh, uh, forest fire management, CFA, local government to do that broader fuel management in behind the properties, in behind the towns, do larger, larger and more strategic um, planned burn programs in particular, and then to really then be able to leverage and piggyback off that, I guess, that strategic fuel breaks that we're, we're putting in. The difference with what we're doing this time to what we've done previously is the strategic fuel break project we're running at the moment isn't just about DELP um, getting involved here with Parks Victoria. It's actually about Surf Coast Shire, CFA, Regional Roads Victoria, Parks, DELP, and other land managers actually getting on board and saying, you know what, we've, got a, we've actually got a shared responsibility here to have a crack at putting some protection buffers around our communities. Um, and the best way we can do that is use the science that's available to us, use the learnings and lessons from you know, multiple different tragedies that we've had across our state and, and broader over the last 20 years and start to do something about it in our own patch. And so it's a big, it's a big shift for us where we went through a program 10 years ago where we put in some of these breaks around the surf coast on the National Park Estate. This time around though, we're actually delving into a whole new world, which is putting in these 40 metre wide strategic fuel breaks, not only in the Crown land, but on private property, on um, council managed land, on uh, roadside easements, on roadsides themselves, and actually trying to create a fair bit of um, protection regimes around not only properties, individual residents, but also egress and access routes for the tourists and the communities as they, as they come and go um, around critical community infrastructure like um, water treatment plans and telecommunication infrastructure and community centres because ultimately that's the sort of stuff we need to be up and running and, and servicing communities if and when the fires do come. Um, so that's about 10 minutes of my four hours speech, Begita. Um, did I cover off on the main points? Um, it, it's interesting because it, it refers to also what Barbara was talking about in that collaborative space. And I think a big part of that is working with our communities as well, that um, 
that that Pete kind of spoke about. Um, so yeah, the next question I guess is to Kylie, and it almost comes off the back of that. Uh, so when you're working with our local businesses, with local community members, Kylie is like a planner and in that bushfire emergency management and climate change space. Uh, how do you, I guess, build that collaborative or intel or skills sharing that, that you probably do as you plan with these people? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so most of the time, uh, if we separate them out, so business owners, so business owners um, are generally um, much more collaborative. So they get on board, they want to understand what's in their bushfire emergency management plan. They want to understand how they will enact the plan. Um, and a lot of it is driven by, you know, how they need to provide refunds, when that will happen. Um, most of the actions are associated with um, code red, extreme and severe weather days. Um, and the general sort of indication from CFA now is that they're wanting to see the Great Ocean Road and all of the townships along there, um, any accommodation providers evacuate um, during those days, particularly the smaller, um, you know, Airbnb um, types of um, businesses. The larger caravan parks, it's really difficult to evacuate. Um, at Gork, we have a number of plans um, that are practised um, emergency management planning for the, the Lawn Caravan Parks, the Anglesey Caravan Park. Um, and that's a little bit more of a complex environment. And to be honest, it really hasn't been tested um, along the Great Ocean Road. I don't think we've had a code red day since Black Saturday. So, um, yeah, so it'll be really interesting to see um, how all of the planning that's been undertaken since 2009 comes into play when we have our next um, Code Red Day. Um, in terms of um, just local residents, um, it's very varied. So some local residents will um, get all of the plans that they need to get their building permit. Once they've got their building permit, they'll never sort of review it or look at it again. And then other people, um, you know, will read their plan, want to understand what their landscape risk is, want to understand what the radiant heat impacts and ember impacts are on their particular dwelling and want to understand what's the best practice for um, reconstruct, you know, for building a house or what's the best practice for vegetation management. Um, and we sort of, you know, I guide people to the um, landscaping for bushfire document that's been developed with the C um, CFA. And then in terms of construction, um, there's a real void at the moment in our knowledge as to where you direct um, owners of houses as to how the, where, where the best practice document is for constructing houses. Um, so Kylie, that, just to interrupt you on that, where would you, where would you suggest that people go for these kinds of preemptive details or information? Um, yeah, it's, it's very um, scattered. So at the moment, construction standard has to be to the Australian standard, which is AS3959-2018. Um, that standard, I believe, Justin can probably correct me, but I believe it's free at the moment. So normally you have to pay for it. But because of the 2019-20, the, the bushfires this summer, you can actually download that um, Australian standard. And that sort of outlines all of the construction standards for the various bells. It's really important to note though that that document, it's almost like a minimum standard. It's, it's not considered, considered in the professional um, arena as being a best practice document. Um, and, and I think the main reason that that is, is that it, there's probably quite a few loopholes in that where it doesn't address ember attack as well as um, it could. Um, 
But yes, unfortunately, um, it is difficult to find some of the information that um, that really does help your house more resilient. So it's definitely sounding like we need to kind of provide a bit of a package in a way. And I think that Amber attack that came up with Kevin Tollhurst conversation as well. Um, I know Justin has spoken. Do you want to add anything to that, Justin, about Amber attack and house loss? Yes, certainly. So I guess Amber Attack um, is probably the most uh, prolific cause of loss um, in the way that it uh, either directly ignites the house or ignites things immediately around. So it's, it's definitely the one that should be covered under all circumstances. There's not really any obvious landscaping scenario that doesn't prevent prolific Amber Attack quite a distance into an urban interface. So we really have to address that at a house and an immediate landscaping um, area. And I would, I would um, completely agree with Kylie's sentiment that, that the two standards, AS395, 9 and NASH, are minimum compliance standards. And once you get a look at those, they, they make it very clear that they are minimum standards that, that try to catch things as a safety net where people aren't sort of trying to build quite a resilient structure. Um, the good news is that as we come into this fire season, you'll start to see formal best practice design guides available, um, freely available on the internet. Uh, we're involved in the, in the assembly of a number of those. And yeah, we've been working pretty hard to try and fill that obvious void that Kylie highlighted. That's super interesting. I'm aware of the time here and I'm just going to ask a bit of a favour if our presenters could stay with us for a couple more minutes rather than finishing on the dot. Apologies. Um, Maddie, have you got maybe just one last question and then we'll wrap it up with our... It is just a very broad question, I suppose, and it's, it's a bit of a dear to the heart of the people from this area of the memories of Ash Wednesday and what's different basically between now and Ash Wednesday, is it more risky or less risky um, to live in this area? And I, the question was about vegetation, but I'm sure there's other, other aspects of risk that you might be able to chat about as well. Um, I guess we could even throw to Pete Ashton for that one. Uh, yeah, I, I guess how you look at it, the, the, the vegetation is probably not much different, um, particularly in the townships as well. I think what we, we've got our building stock is a little bit better, but, but I think in terms of just risk to your own life, if you think about where we were back in 1983 compared to now, you know, just things like having um, the fire danger index and it's being, it's widely distributed. We know what day it is. It's a code red severe. Just having that understanding is a big improvement. We now have, you know, the emergency management Vic um, telephone app. So really no one, there is no reason anyone should actually get caught in a bushfire uh, if you take some really basic steps. As far as our houses, and, and, and Justin and Kylie might like to add to this, there is still work to do there and, and gardens and things like that. There's an understanding in that um, sphere that we need to get better at as a community. Um, and, and we probably, and it's going to become more important as the climate dries out and we probably see more exposure to fire than we do at the moment in the Otways. Thanks, Pete. I'm happy to have a go at that one as well, Brigitte. I think the other, the other um, sort of really strong element that's changed since 83 in my eyes is the amount of people that we have wandering and driving and moving through the landscape. Um, on any decent summer day or on the Great Ocean Road, everyone knows the traffic, uh, the traffic lines along, the, along our, our thoroughfares. Um, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot more housing stocks, I would, I would argue, probably than we did back in 83. Um, we have a lot more probably absentee landholders or bed and breakfasts or people from out of region coming in just to, to occupy these, um, these residential areas during this period. So we have to work hard to continually push our message a whole new audience of people all the time. So it's not a single message once, it's actually multiple messages a lot of the time on repeat 
because the, the clientele just keep changing. It's not just the same community we're talking to. It's a whole heap of people that just come and go. And it's, the diversity is fantastic, but the diversity is something we've got to continue to plan for. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, Kylie and your work with accommodation providers, and I know that CFA does a lot of work with accommodation providers, uh, and certainly Gallup and PV do their, their uh, regular run-throughs of campsites and so on. Um, Kylie, would you like to add anything about that? Um, look, I think if you, if you ask me, has the risk increased since Ash Wednesday? In my opinion, it has. Um, there's a significant amount of housing stock that's been added. Um, and also there's a significant amount of housing stock that is there at the interface that has not been built to any standard. Um, so it makes the townships extremely vulnerable to ember attack. Um, so whether it's a, an Airbnb, whether it's a tourist operator or not, the structure to structure ignitions, as we saw in, um, in Y River can happen potentially to any of our communities. Um, so I think that, you know, from that perspective, yes, definitely, I think we have an increased risk. Um, and the other thing that you need to consider is the messaging's change. So in Ash Wednesday, the messaging was about stay and defend your home. So if you stay and defend your home, you probably have a much higher likelihood of putting out an ember that's ignited, you know, your outdoor setting or your, um, you know, just little bits and pieces around your house. But the messaging now is to leave. And when I talk to most of my clients, they're going to leave, their plan is to leave. So when you get a huge amount of the population leaving, that means you've got a huge amount of housing stock that is undefended. And if you don't have... Um, you know, air defence or you don't have CFA defence, um, which you can't possibly have in such a broad area, then you're going to get more significant um, housing loss, um, which then you get structure to structure and it goes through community, you know, goes through areas like it did at Y River. So my answer would be that, yes, I think the risk has significantly increased. Um, so I've just got one question for Barbara Norman and then I'll ask both speakers to wrap up. I'm aware that we're um, really impinging on everyone's time. We've gone over the hour. Uh, Barbara, someone is actually asking about community scenario events and I know that in my work I've done scenario events with communities and I think Mandy and Pete, I think a lot of people whose heads you can see in this space have. Yeah. So someone's actually saying how would a community actually organise that themselves? Sure. Well, certainly um, uh, you probably need to get some uh, financial support. So uh, a community can certainly start this process by um, establishing what kind of scenarios are important, um, what, what scenarios are important in that particular community because they're all different. So culture, all sorts of things are important. Um, ensure that there's a, a range of stakeholders. Indigenous engagement is obviously very important when it's coming to fire management. I'm very pleased to see that coming out from the Royal Commission uh, nationally uh, um, uh, uh, this year. Um, and uh, working with organisations like uh, CSIRO and the scientists um, and uh, scientists in the universities, uh, certainly that's what we've done in the ACT where I live. And um, so that kind of collaboration there. So collaboration is key, uh, range of stakeholders is key, but starting from the community up, I think is a really excellent basis. Um, and uh, there's so many skills out there, as we've seen today, um, people prepared to give their time to such a process. And actually your reach, and I was um, on the Central Coastal Board of Victoria for a long time, and certainly had quite a lot of time down in your way and certainly your region and the Geelong region has had quite a history of community initiation initiated processes so there's some some uh, some a very good track record there actually so uh, I think it's just a, it's a matter of deciding to do it and get the science um, I'm more familiar with dealing with sea level rises scenario planning so 
You know, what if it's half a metre sea level rise? What if it's one? What if it's one and a half? What if it's two? What if it's more? But at least you've gone through that process, as I said much earlier in my talk. Then you're much better prepared. So nothing's stopping you. A lot to be gained. Yeah, that's great, Barbara. And I'll just remind people that my email will actually be on the last slide of this. And if you've got any follow-up questions, because that's really my job. So <laughs> uh, don't be shy. Um, give me an email. Just to go over the questions quickly, we have missed out on some, one of them being um, Great Ocean Road, coastal inundation, and the scenario down at Apollo Bay. Um, there's quite a bit of fan mail as well, guys, so thank you. And Dave Roberts says, quite a few um, requests for Plan Burns, please, <laughs> which I can follow up with you about. Um, again, if you've got specific questions, please just email them to me and I'll make sure that they get to the correct people. Um, so just mindful of time, like I said, uh, I'm going to ask each of our presenters, not panellists, but the uh, presenters, <clears throat> same question as we've done through all of the, the webinars. Justin, um, what is the future of living in fire prone areas? So I guess reflecting on what we've just spoken about, about increasing hazards since uh, Ash Wednesday, um, that 37 years um, till now, we've seen a really significant escalation in the fire weather severity profile, which means the likes of Ash Wednesday are getting more and more likely um, in any given fire season as we've reached the current day. Um, unfortunately, the modelling is suggesting that, that that degree of change in the last 37 years is a small fraction of what we'll see in the next 37 years in our current trajectory. And I think um, the big challenge for everyone will be um, dealing with the idea that these big fire events are, are coming fairly infrequently and almost to the point that they're enough to sort of overlook and, um, and you know, focus on other aspects of risk management in other parts of our life. But uh, unfortunately, in the foreseeable future, um, we'll shift from that being conveniently long intervals to so frequent and repeated that it'll be it'll force us to change if we don't proactively change. So I think the, the challenge we have in front of us is to proactively change and embrace this idea that we have to come, become fully adapted to bushfire before nature forces our hand on it, which would be a really unfortunate um, way that the process could unfold. Indeed. So Barbara, same question. What is the future of living in bushfire prone regions? Well, I think the reality is there is a future uh, because that, that is our landscape. So I think to say the other doesn't really make sense. But so we will be living in a fire prone uh, landscape and Justin's absolutely right um, in terms of uh, uh, accelerated um, uh, risk in the future. And we only have to look at what's happening in California right now to, to see what's happening happening there. Uh, so um, we can do this, but we need to, and we haven't had time to really talk about this much, but we need to be investing very strongly in good land use planning in our townships. Um, we certainly won't be able to afford uh, adding to the risk. We've got enough of a legacy, if you like, to deal with at the moment in terms of uh, existing urban settlements. And so to um, uh, allow those to spread more sprawl, if you like, through these through these bushland environments would be inviting disaster in my view. So we need to be um, ahead of the game, uh, better investment in land use planning, compact urban development, compact villages, and ideally in responding to all of that, um, uh, doing it in an environmentally sustainable way, water sensitive urban design, uh, managing bushfire risk, uh, renewable energy, all those things come into play. So yes, I think so, but it might be more like compact eco villages. And that holistic, collaborative, community-based right. planning. Yep. All those things. And because fire isn't the only climate risk, I think more and more we have to talk about climate resilient communities and think about all those risks together. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. I'll hand over to Charlotte in a second, but I just wanted to personally say thanks to Justin and Barbara for presenting today. Really interesting. I'm sure there'll be lots of feedback and hopefully I'll get emails that I can 
even harass you guys with your answers. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and also our panellists, Peter Ashton, Kylie Steele and Dave Roberts. Thanks heaps, guys. I know all of you have busy working lives, so it's a bit of a um, big favour. And to the two organisations that's pulled us all together and done this enormous job, community-led initiative from the very get-go, Friends of Lawn and Ada, Aries and Lake and District Association, just awesome work. And really, I guess if we could, um, uh, yeah, support other community initiatives like this, it would be really good. So thanks, everyone, and Charlotte. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. And thank you, Justin and Barbara. Very interesting additions to our discussions. And we just hope that you've enjoyed the series and more importantly, that you've learned a lot and leave much better informed about the risks that we face. And as Begetta has said, if anybody's got any follow-up questions or feedback, they can use her email, which is on the screen. I might just, sorry, Charlotte, I might just interrupt and ask Zach to put up the final slide so we've got that information. Is that right? Yep. Sure. Um, just a little plug. If anybody would like to join the Friends of Lawn or the Areas and Lethen District Association, they would be welcomed. And the information about how to join is on their websites, which is in the website addresses are on the screen. I personally would like to thank the Friends of Lawn and Mary Lush and Penny Hoare in particular for instigating this series. It was, they were, it was their idea. And Mary and Penny, along with Suzanne Kavanagh, from Ada have spent many hours putting the series together. So now thanks also go to the Surf Coast Shire officers and DELP for their willing assistance. Our most important and heartfelt thanks go to our six speakers, David Lindemann, Stephen Farrell, Janet Stanley, Kevin Tolhurst, Barbara Norman and Justin Leonard, who have so willingly shared their considerable expertise and knowledge with us. And I think we're all enormously grateful that they've given us their time um, Come on our webinar and hopefully it will be shared and viewed by a lot more people when it's up on YouTube. So thank you very much everybody. Thanks all.